team! This project started as a quick gown to give myself that overwhelming sense of accomplishment for my birthday. Yay me! Then, my dress research took me down the ever-awful colonial aesthetic rabbit hole while actual events were happening in the costuming world, so the original notes on this project rundown went to a dark place. In order to satisfy my need for honest, personally gratifying content, I decided to use the dress as a bridge through my fascination with history, the good and the bad, and the character that inspired the creation, Lady Dimitrescu. Our story picks up with a package from Burnley and Trowbridge earlier this month. I ordered gown fabric for Sailor Mercury after realizing that settling for a less sheer custom printed fabric that was more expensive would leave me wondering what could have been. I also picked up white fine satin striped muslin, deciding to try out a chemise à la reine for the summer, crediting the Instagram algorithm for all the froth in my feed. Keeping the fabrics company, I added brown threads for the taffeta, still waiting to become an early Tudor kirtle, and a petticoat for my French jacket. The shears were a general purchase for the sewing kit since my orange handles tend to stand out when I'm away from the studio. The shuttle is going to go live with the tape loom where I'm slowly working on trim for Princess Tiana. I ordered more pins for the kit as well. I've mentioned before that I keep sewing kits everywhere around the house, so I need a lot of appropriate pins to spread amongst them. The thread binders will go somewhere. Now, I hadn't originally planned on making this into a full-on process video, so we're going to roughly jump over to the bodice fitting and adjustments. I started with Laughing Moon's robe en chemise pattern. I lengthened the bodice pieces by two inches and changed it to center front opening. The linen lining is being fitted over all support garments. I've pinned the front and back seams, shoulder straps, and high neck darts to be form-fitting, but not tight. The underbodice is just a base for the gathered cotton gown. I'm short-waisted, so I'm paying attention to how much seam allowance is left to ensure that the skirts will fall properly over the bum pad. Here, I've removed the lining, which has been marked with heat-erasable marking pens. I use a curved ruler to even out the new seam lines. It's here where I decided to cut down to a low neckline. It was only about a quarter inch higher than the pattern's low neckline option, but I erred on the side of caution by adding the high neckline so they wouldn't have to add fabric or recut the front entirely. I'm leaving a seam allowance of about an inch in the front. Just like stays, I like to have some room for size changes over the age of the gown. Picking stitches out of linen is not my favorite time sink, so I've left most of the lining together for now while going through these adjustments. As long as the seams and corners match up, I rarely have issues with this method.
I shortened the shoulder strap pattern pieces about 5 eighths of an inch, then cut the excess on the lining straps. My markings on the back are so very uneven, so I did a little math to split the difference. I picked the stitches up to the new curve, Mark the new seams in a different color, again remembering to add the seam allowance, Then cut the fabric back. I'll find out as soon as I go to the machine to stitch this up that my side and back pieces no longer match, but the resulting waist shape turns out to be quite pleasing.
Skipping over all of the pesky gown construction, let's run through the layers I chose for this project. First, we have a cotton shirt that has seen better days, but it's short-sleeved and has no holes, so we're good. Next is a machine-stitched stash buster pieced petticoat of questionable fiber content. Most of it is white or off-white or mildly age-stained white. It cost me zero dollars, so I'm not complaining. It was constructed using the Burnley and Trowbridge under petticoat hack. I used a brown cotton twill tape also from the stash. My stays started with Simplicity 8579 and were altered to add front lacing and leather binding. I believe I used a medium linen interlined with canvas and a printed cotton for the lining. They are clearly well-worn and pretty sturdy. This is the Francis Rump View B from Scroot Patterns, and another stash buster with only one piecing seam this time. I sourced my polyfill stuffing from an old plushie and an Elizabethan bum roll that I no longer use. The pattern was very easy to follow and has a great shape. Next is a white linen petticoat. I pulled from my vault of fabricstore.com 3.5 ounce yardage, which I now realize is getting dangerously low. The construction follows the Burnley and Trowbridge petticoat so long, although most of it was done by machine. I can't seem to get rid of some of the heat pen marks, so this will have to go through the wash soon. Otherwise, I'll just cover it with some white work embroidery and call it good. And finally, we have the gown. It's so pretty. The lining edges were surged to contain raveling and a high number of wispy threads. The bodice and skirts are stitched together at the waist straight down from the front of the arm side and around the back to the other side. The front edges of the lining lace closed for adjustability, and I knotted a metal jewelry finding to the end so that I wouldn't have to look for my bodkin. The outer edges close with gathering ties at the bodice neckline, bodice waist, and the skirt waist. I couldn't stitch the bodice front and front skirts together because of the difference in width, but I was able to tie the lacing together to keep everything in place while I was dressing. Sometimes I question the amount of lacing involved in my makes. I love using pins, but I like specific pins, which I tend to lose often, which is probably historically accurate. And I also don't want them snagging on this very light fabric. It also seems to defeat the purpose of having an easy, light garment. The skirt is slightly trained and curves at the side seam. My piece didn't match the pattern since I used the full width of the muslin, but the effect is there. I added an extra row of gathering in the middle of the sleeve and added one quarter inch tape to keep the gathers in place.
there's that happy accident of waste curve. The shoulder straps and underarm are not gathered at all, which keeps it from looking too bulky in those spots. Let's take a look at how I decided to wear this birthday gift to myself. The first look is Adeline. I've chosen my red lightweight wool petticoat, brown and red spotted handkerchief, indigo and white bordered handkerchief, both from Burnley Trowbridge, a length of black silk ribbon, red dangle earrings from the tiny wren, and a large straw look hat. Quote, Adeline is about 38, of common size, black complexion, with a mole on her right cheek, and there is a scar on the back of the neck. End quote. I came across this runaway ad browsing Freedom on the Move for clothing descriptions on another project. While the original text, printed in July 1854, is longer and without material information, the mole on Adeline's cheek and her scar cinched it for me since I have both of those. I put the look together based on Augustino Bruni's paintings of free people of the Caribbean in the latter part of the 18th century. I am not wearing the bum pad as there is no need to exaggerate a silhouette that I already have. One that has been appropriated time and time again throughout history, putting one group of folks down for it while praising those who could instead pay for the same. The second look is Jenny. I started with a basic white handkerchief. Then comes the absurdly long, but effective, gold poly taffeta sash. This was pieced from my Georgian Storm leftovers, and I used the scalloping shears to make a decorative edge. I added a red book to stick with our primary color theme, and we know there is no enjoyment like reading. Next is my Princess Allura hat without the mice. The brim is wired for jaunty bending, and it has an adjustable cotton lining which helps to keep it in place. The garnet crystal cluster earrings are from Dames à la Mode, and this little pearl and garnet brooch came from a vintage haul a couple of years ago. Quote, Jenny is smart, active, and rather lusty. End quote. We accept the full of vigor definition of lusty in this case. Now, this ad was chosen almost entirely because it came from New York in 1774. I will never understand how people continue to think that slavery didn't exist in the North. According to the transcription, Jenny and her husband Mark, a serious fellow who reads well, may have been using her note to find a master as a traveling pass. Good for them! Please visit Not Your Mama's History to learn about the lives of enslaved individuals all over during the 18th and 19th centuries. The final look is Alcina. I made a white linen pocket with white work embroidery cobbled together from three Urban Threads designs. They're combined to approximate the Demetresque crest. Similarly, I made a flower pendant from jewelry findings in my stash and attached it to a pearl necklace from a vintage vendor. Pro tip, don't overlook the $1 jewelry and hair accessory section at the local beauty shop. Most of it can be taken apart and remade into fantastic costume pieces. The large pearl drop earrings are from In the Long Run Designs. The black hair flower is from my stash. The black hat blank is from Burnley and Trowbridge. I added some bows with fancy aglets that came from a Renaissance Fair resale, and ostrich feathers from another hat. The mitts are black poly taffeta with linen lining and red accents. This is a Burnley and Trowbridge pattern that is incredibly easy to follow for any historical kit. I decided to try a decorative stitch on the seam to fancy it up a bit, and I'm quite pleased with the result. I cut them a bit too long, but I like the way that I can layer them under the cinched gown sleeves. Tying in the 19th century portrait of Lady Dimitrescu from the game, 
I'm adding my own red glass pewter dragon goblet. I added liquid rouge from LBCC Historical, which can be used on both cheeks and lips. Now, since Kruger hands don't fit my personal aesthetic, I decided to use my decorative dagger scissors as Alcina's melee weapon. Quote, you will learn what it means to insult House Dimitrescu. End quote. Since I started the hobby on the pseudo-historical side, one important aspect of my fandom mashups is the ability to wear a lot of the pieces out of character. During the planning phase, I always gather a ton of reference artwork, documents, and fashion plates when available so that I can determine how the recognizable character accessories can be swapped out. I did the same here with Lady Dimitrescu. As you've seen, Changing the hat, wearing minimal makeup, and leaving the death shears at home, I would be perfectly prepared for a garden stroll with friends. As a closing thought, my original notes for this video turned into a visual essay linking Lady Dimitrescu's Elizabeth Bathory-style maiden napping and the evolution of the robe en chemise by any of its contemporary or modern names. I titled it Theft of Bodies, Theft of Fashion. In summary, the fabric was stolen and wiped out. The community from whom the fashion was exploited received no compensation for the appropriative practices, much like today. And while we don't sympathize with literal colonizers in this house, the woman who is credited with popularizing the style was scandalized for it too. The emotional labor required to summarize the impact of the textile trade, I'm using air quotes, on this style of gown alone would be costly. I edited my thoughts down to what I've just presented, leaving out my own commentary and perspective on the historical costuming community that I've watched and experienced over the last couple of decades, and the most recent events. As friends and applicants for allyship, I hope that you'll have the chance to do some research if the topic interests you. At all. Please do your reading. Thanks for hanging out!